or tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Friday evening, November the 14th, 1969. 120 Fellowship, Berkeley, California. Tonight I'd like to read to you by way of introduction to my message from the 16th chapter of Mark's Gospel. The closing verses of that 16th chapter of Mark's Gospel, beginning at the 15th verse. What is commonly called the Great Commission of Jesus Christ. We read Mark 16, verses 15 through 20. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth, and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Here Jesus gives his plan for presenting the gospel to the entire world and to every creature. And he commands his disciples to go out and to preach the gospel, and he declares that according to a person's reaction to the gospel, that person will either be eternally saved or eternally lost, and there is nothing in between. And then he declares that as this gospel is preached in accordance with his commandment and in obedience to what he has told them to do, there are five distinctive supernatural signs that will follow the preaching of the gospel. He says, these are the signs, the first one in my name, and every one of these signs is in the name of Jesus. In my name they shall cast out devils. Secondly, they shall speak with new tongues. Thirdly, they shall take up serpents. Fourthly, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And fifthly, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Whenever I speak about these five signs, I'm always reminded of the story of David the shepherd boy going out to meet the great giant Goliath. And you remember that Goliath had defied the armies of Israel for many, many days, and no one knew what to do about Goliath. And along came David, and he said, I'll handle this giant for you. Just let me have a go at him. And Saul came along, and he said, well, if you're going out, you'll need my armor. And so he gave David, who was still a young lad and not full grown, his armor. And the scripture says, David tried the armor on, and he didn't fit him, and he didn't know how to behave in the armor, and he said, that's no good. He said, I don't need your armor, king. I'm just going to take what I've got. And he took his sling, and he ran towards the giant, and he went down into the valley that lay between the two armies, and in the dry bed of the brook, he picked up five smooth stones, and that was all he needed. He went out to meet the giant. Why do you think he took five stones? Do you think it was a miracle that he killed the giant? No. It was no miracle. He'd been practicing. While all the rest of the people had been hanging around wondering what to do, David had been out on the mountainside practicing. Why did he take five sling stones? Because he knew he might miss four times, but he'd never missed five times. Now, in my opinion today, the evangelization of this world in the name of Jesus Christ, not least in the very area where we are tonight, is like going out to meet that giant Goliath. And if you want to put on the armor of theology and seminary training and long words and all that, fine. But as for me, I'll take my five smooth pebbles from the brook. These signs shall follow them that believe. And I believe one smooth pebble can accomplish more than all the theology put together. When it hits the giant in the forehead, down he goes. I believe in the supernatural attestation of the Word of God. I've been a missionary in two fields and traveled in many. And I'll tell you, I would never leave my hometown with the gospel of Jesus Christ for any foreign land today 
if I did not have an inner assurance that if I preach the right message, God will supernaturally attest it with signs following. Otherwise, I would feel that I would be wasting my time. There is a little book which I believe is out of print, unfortunately now, that was printed and published in Britain before the Second World War. Uh, the book was written by a man named William Burton, who was an engineer in Britain, and went out in the year 1913 as a missionary to the Belgian Congo and spent something like 40 years of pioneer mission work in the Belgian Congo. When he arrived, the, the people there had not heard the gospel. When he and his co-workers had to go out in the Congo uprising later on, they left behind well over 1,000 self-governing, autonomous, local, full gospel churches. This was indeed an apostolic ministry. And Brother Burton wrote this book, which was called Signs Following. And he took each one of the five signs that I have mentioned to you here tonight, and he very, very carefully indicated and described how every one of these five signs had been present in their ministry in the Congo. And he gave very, very careful, objective, detailed account of how he had seen each of the five signs in the Congo. Preservation from snakes, preservation from poison in food and drink, the healing of the sick, believers speaking with new tongues, and the casting out of evil spirits. None of these things is out of date. Where God's people believe and obey, they still happen exactly the same today as they happened in the days of Jesus and the early church. None of these signs is unnecessary. None of them is superfluous. Every one of them has its purpose. In the Belgian Congo, when the native evangelists went out into new territory, they always challenged the authority of the local witch doctor. And the local witch doctor would always fight back to maintain his kingdom of darkness in that area. And in many, many cases, he would use the poisons in which he was an expert and contrive to get them in the food or the drink of these native preachers. And Burton gives several different instances in which men either ate or drank things which contained enough poison to kill a village and suffered no ill effects whatever. So that sign was fulfilled. He described how his own wife stepped on one of the most poisonous snakes in the Congo and experienced no ill effects. The thing had its back broken and lay there hissing, ineffective in the pathway as she walked over it. Jesus said, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You know what that is? That's good news. That's what the gospel is. If anything comes to you that isn't good news, it's not the gospel. Because the gospel is good news. A lot of what is preached today in the name of the gospel is anything but good news. And you see the people going out of church, you know they haven't been listening to good news. You've just got to look at their faces to see that. Burton also gave careful, illustrated examples of these other supernatural signs. In the case of the healing of the sick, he illustrated it with two x-ray photographs, one of his own colon riddled with cancer. And then his African elders laid hands on him, prayed for him in the name of Jesus. Subsequently, a second x-ray was taken, showing him with a perfectly healthy colon. This is a medically authenticated miracle of healing, a confirmation of what Jesus promised would happen. If we analyze the reasons for these signs, we could say that the promise of immunity from poison and the promise of protection from certain rights are for the protection of the messengers of the gospel. The promise of laying hands on the sick is to minister to the needs of those who are physically sick. The promise that believers would speak with new tongues is to endue the believers with the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit through the baptism of the Holy Spirit to make them effective witnesses for Jesus Christ. And the promise of casting out evil spirits is because people have evil spirits and they need to be delivered from evil spirits and the way by which they can be delivered from evil spirits is by having the evil spirits cast out. Burton gave in his book a very vivid little illustration of how the church has fallen away from the truth of the message which Jesus committed. He said that in the Belgian Congo, under the time when the Belgian government was in control, the mail used to be delivered 
by postmen that would carry the mail sack on their back along the jungle trails from village to village. And he described how one postman, being lazy and irresponsible, carrying his sack along the trail, thought it was a little too heavy. So he stopped and took out a few of the packages and threw them into the bushes and just walked on with a lightened mail sack, but he was cheating the people. But somebody happened to follow behind and found these items of mail thrown away in the bushes, picked them up, and the man was discovered and severely punished for his negligence and his dishonesty. And Burton said, the Church of Jesus Christ has been like that dishonest postman. Jesus gave them a full mail bag to deliver, but a lot of them have found it was too heavy to carry the whole load, so they've taken out little bits of the gospel here and there and just thrown them in the bushes. But Burton said that ministers that do that need to be punished no less severely than the postman that took out some of the items of the mail and threw them in the bushes. And I agree. Tonight I want to speak to you specifically on the first sign, in my name they shall cast out devils. I prefer Philip's translation, and that's why I've called my little booklet there, Expelling Demons. Philip says, in my name they shall expel demons. I like that because it brings it down to modern terminology. So I called my book Expelling Demons, my booklet. One thing we have to acknowledge, if we're objective and honest, is that Jesus in his earthly ministry probably must spend more time doing this one thing than any other single aspect of his ministry. I do not believe it would be an exaggeration. In fact, I believe it would be an underestimate to say that he spent at least one quarter of his public ministry delivering people from evil spirits. Now, I believe that Jesus was a realist. I knew that he, I believe he knew what he was dealing with. And I believe that he knew the right way to deal with it. In Mark 1.39, right at the beginning of the, of the ministry of Jesus, Philip's translation says this, So he continued throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and expelling evil spirits. And right at the end of the ministry of Jesus, in Luke's Gospel, Phillips gives this statement, I must walk today and tomorrow, and I must continue my work of healing and expelling evil spirits, and the third day I shall be made complete. So that this is very clearly brought out in Phillips' translation that the expelling of evil spirits was a continuous feature of the ministry of Jesus that began when he began his public ministry and continued till his public ministry was closed. And I like that description of his ministry in Galilee, particularly in Mark 1.39. So he continued throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and expelling evil spirits. This was the basic feature of his ministry. In every synagogue he walked into, he preached and he expelled evil spirits. It was not an isolated phenomenon that just happened in one place here or there. It was the regular nature of his ministry. Now I believe... As I said before, that Jesus knew what he was doing. I don't believe he was a dreamer, a fanatic, or a man out of his time, or out of touch with reality. I believe that there are evil spirits. I believe that evil spirits are just as real today as they were in the days of Jesus. And I believe that people need deliverance from evil spirits just as much today as they did in the days of Jesus. I don't believe anything has changed in this respect. Not merely do I believe it, but I've proved it more times than I can count in my own personal experience. And I can say to the glory of God, I have seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people delivered from evil spirits when this gospel is preached as the way it is presented in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is an evil spirit? Well, the Bible doesn't give us a definition. It doesn't give us an explanation. It doesn't tell us where they came from. The Bible is a very selective revelation. I have my own private ideas, but it's not my business to preach my ideas. It's my business to preach what the Word says. You'll notice that when Israel came out of Egypt, they came to a certain lake, which was called Mara, and the waters were bitter, and they could not drink the water. And Moses cried out to God, and God showed Moses how to make the waters sweet. He said, throw this tree in, the waters will be made sweet. The waters were made sweet, and Israel could drink. You'll notice how practical God is. God never told Israel why the waters were bitter. But he did tell them how to make the waters sweet. God doesn't tell us too much about where evil spirits come from, but he does tell us how to get rid of them, and that's the thing that matters. 
And that's what I'm going to deal with tonight. Not where they come from, but where they need to go to. <laughs> Evil spirits are persons. Incidentally, let me say this, the other word used for them in the Greek of the New Testament is demon. Devils is a very incorrect translation. The word devil should be used in the singular. It's the title of one person, Satan himself. But Satan, in the 12th chapter of Matthew, is called Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. Beelzebub means, as you probably know, Lord of Flies, and is the title of a modern novel. I don't know whether the modern novelist knew exactly what he was talking about. I've never read the novel. But that's what it means. And Satan is called Beelzebub as the Lord or Master of the demons. And the demons are compared with flies, which is a good reason. First of all, there are uncounted myriads of them. Secondly, they're very pestilential things. They disturb you, they trouble you, they take away your peace. Thirdly, they feed on that which is rotten and unclean, and fourthly, they transmit infection. And in all these pictures, in all these respects, if you take the insect world and not merely the world of the housefly, you find that they're an extremely accurate parable of the demon world. And actually, while I was in Africa as a missionary there, I saw a film which impressed me tremendously called The Other World. And it dealt with the insect world. And it showed in a very, very convincing way that man just about succeeds in holding his own against the insect world. That it's not far from being the case that the insect world could submerge the human race and put it out of business. Do you know the greatest single killer in the world is malaria, which is the product of the bite of the particular mosquito, the Anopheles female mosquito. Do you know that according to statistics, one person dies every ten seconds in the world of malaria? See what a challenge this insect world is. See how many untold millions perish, are contaminated, defiled by the insect world. And this is just a type of the demon world, the world of evil spirits. And Satan is the lord of the flies. And when Jesus came into his fullness of his earthly ministry, he came in head-on conflict with this demon world. He challenged it and he put it to an open defeat. And then he said to the people of his day, If I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom of God is coming to you. Here is the open clash of the two kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. The kingdom of God represented by Jesus and the authority in his name and the power of his blood. The kingdom of Satan represented by the evil demonic forces that feed and fasten upon the wretched human race seek to enslave it, torment it, and destroy it. And the business of the Christian is to accept this challenge, enter into this conflict, and administer the victory which Christ has won on our behalf. Demons, evil spirits, are persons. They have every mark of personality that is normally recognized in psychology. That is to say, they feel, they have emotions. In the second chapter of the epistle of James, the demons believe and tremble. They believe. They're capable of believing. They know. The demons in the man in the 19th chapter of the book of Acts, whom the seven sons of Sceva sought to deliver, they said, Jesus, I acknowledge. Paul, I know about. But who are ye? They have very up-to-date information. They acknowledge Jesus and they know the ministers of the gospel. They have will. Jesus said, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, finds none, then says, I will return into my house. They make a decision. And they have the ability to speak many, many times. They spoke out in the ministry of Jesus, challenged him, argued with him, and played with him. And certainly one thing is true. They recognized the true identity of Jesus Christ something like two years before his own disciples ever really understood who he was. They are disembodied. They are spirits without bodies. And their strongest desire and craving is to enter a body, preferably a human body. Whatever their particular perverse and evil nature is, they cannot express it as they wish, except through a body. If it is a demon of hate, it has to have a mind and emotions to hate through. 
If it's a demon of blasphemy, it has to have a tongue to blaspheme through. If it's a demon of lust, it has to have sexual organs to lust through. If it's a demon of fear, it has to have emotions through which it express its fear. Every kind of demon longs and craves and seeks with all its will and might to be in a body through which it can express itself. And we find that when Jesus dealt with a gathering demoniac, rather than be disembodied, they preferred to go into the body of the swine. And that was where Jesus actually allowed them to go. And isn't it remarkable to think that one human being could contain within himself the power of enough evil spirits to plunge 2,000 swine immediately into a lake. I don't know whether any of us realize the tremendous inner potentiality of a human nature. But I'll tell you one person who does, and that's the devil. And he seeks to capture it for himself, to make it his instrument, his vessel, his means of expression. How do we identify the presence and the operation of evil spirits? I would suggest that there are certain distinctive marks. First of all, let me offer an observation. Many people are deceived by the King James translation, which says, in most places, some phrase like this, possessed of evil spirits, possessed of devil. Now, the word possessed, because of its associations in the English language, suggests total being, being totally taken over. If I possess something, I totally own it. And uh, many people say, well, I'm definitely not possessed of demons. And the, probably you're right. But you see, the Greek doesn't use those phrases at all. I'm sure there are others here who know Greek. The Greek New Testament only uses two phrases, really. The one is to have an evil spirit or an unclean spirit. And in the 13th chapter of Luke, a woman who was bent down and could not straighten herself physically but had permanent curvature of the spine was said to have an evil spirit of infirmity. All that was affected in her was just her spine. That was all. No other part of her was affected but she was said to have an evil spirit. The other phrase that's used in the New Testament is to be demonized. It's a verb. You can transliterate it accurately from Greek into English to be demonized, to have a demon problem. And where in one gospel about one person it uses the phrase to have an unclean spirit, in the corresponding passage in another gospel it says to be demonized. These two words are used interchangeably. Now if a person is totally possessed and taken over by evil spirits, normally you will look for such a person in an institution. It will either be a prison or an asylum. The majority of people that are in that condition, are not fit to move around publicly in society. We had a man yesterday. He didn't come to the meeting, but the pastor that I was with was dealing with him, and he became so dangerous and threatening his own life and the life of his wife and children that they had to have him physically confined. They could not allow him to be at large. But notice that the great majority of people to whom Jesus ministered were not in that category. They were not raving lunatics, and they were not dangerous criminals. The Gadarene demoniac is probably the obvious exception. The rest of them were more or less normal human men and women. The man in the first chapter of Mark's Gospel had apparently sat in the same synagogue every Sabbath, maybe for many years. No one even suspected that anything was wrong with him till Jesus walked in under the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit and then this mysterious inner power was forced out into the open and began to speak through the man's lips and challenge Jesus. But that man had been able to behave perfectly normally, it appears, Sabbath after Sabbath in that synagogue. He was not a lunatic. He was not a criminal. And the majority of people to whom Jesus ministered were people that could walk safely and observe decent standards of behavior in the streets of Galilee, in the synagogues, in their homes. They were normal men and women such as we have in our cities and in our churches today. Just the same kind of person. They were not possessed but they still needed deliverance. And Jesus ministered to them by the thousands. Now some people will tell you, and it just depends what a country you're in, they'll tell you whatever country, if you're in the United States, well they don't have demons in the United States, but they have them in China or Africa. And if you happen to be in Africa, you know what they'll tell you there, they have demons in the United States, but they don't have them in Africa. It's so convenient to believe they have them everywhere else but where you are. 
Now, I have lived eight years in Africa. I spent five years as, as a missionary and three years as a soldier. And I found plenty of demons in Africa, but I never found so many demons in Africa as I found in the United States. I mean, I'm not saying that I, my experience is conclusive, that that is my personal experience. People will tell you, oh well, where people worship idols and where they practice witchcraft, then that's where you look for demons. Well, you don't have to go outside San Francisco to look for witchcraft, do you? You realize that? As a matter of fact, in my opinion, this, again, it's a personal opinion, there's far more witchcraft in the United States today than there is in Africa. Much more. And I'm not jesting. I mean exactly what I'm saying. In my personal opinion, witchcraft is a much greater threat to the United States than communism. Far greater. It's in every area. It's infiltrated every section of your society from the highest echelons, the level of your presidents downwards. This country is being deliberately infiltrated by the forces of witchcraft and sorcery. Sorcery is that which uses drugs to produce its end. The whole drug epidemic you have in this country is the expression of the demonic power of sorcery. If you deal with a drug addict, if you get to the root cause, his problem is the spirit of sorcery. However, let me point out to you that Jesus ministered almost exclusively to Jews. Very, very rarely in his earthly ministry did he minister to Gentiles. And for that reason, we can say that he ministered to people who for 15 centuries had been forbidden on pain of death to worship idols or to practice witchcraft. Nevertheless, he spent his time casting evil spirits out of them. So do not let anybody believe you that there's some area of the world which is somehow magically free from this problem. It would be nice if it were, but there isn't. And San Francisco, I would say, is about a saturation point for demonic power. You can walk in the streets, see it in the faces of the people, and feel it in the air all around you. If I had to choose, I'd go back to Africa from that point of view. But on the other hand, I have to say I'm happy in the United States because the Lord put me here. You are not possessed necessarily because you need deliverance. You're not totally taken over. You're not a lunatic. You're not a criminal. You're not a murderer. But that doesn't mean you don't need deliverance. You may not have deliberately worshipped idols. You may not have deliberately practiced witchcraft. That doesn't guarantee that you don't need deliverance. You see, the human personality is compared in the scripture to a city. He that ruleth his own spirit, the scripture says, is better than he that taketh a city. And he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. This, to me, is the most simple and yet vivid picture of the inner nature of the human personality in terms that we can all understand. Every one of us has got a city inside us. Now, the city I usually use by way of illustration is the city of Chicago, because that's where I lived for about a year and a half. Any great American city would do. If I knew San Francisco well enough, I could use that, or Berkeley, or whatever city we might be in. But you will agree with me that in every major city, there are many different types of area and many different types of occupant. And the type of area decides the type of occupant, or you can put it the other way around, the type of occupant decides the area. For instance, I'm sure some of you are familiar with Chicago, you start in the middle at the loop, the downtown area, you've got the big stores and uh, the smart shops and so on. Then you move just a street or two west, you've got the big financial undertakings, the banks and the mortgage companies and all that kind of thing. You move a little south from there and you've got the area of the depots and the warehouses and the factories. You move a little further south and you're in a residential area which is about 80 or 90 percent Negro. Or you go back to the loop and you move west and you hit an area which is primarily Polish, where the names of the streets are Polish and where people still quite frequently speak in Polish. Or you go back to the loop and you move a little north and you get to an area which is primarily Jewish. You move a little further and you get to an area which is primarily Swedish. And if you want to get on there, you have to pile a Svenska because that's what they do. It's called, in fact, Andersonville, just recently. So, and then you go a little further out into the suburbs, you get the type of dweller who lives in the suburbs, the person who can commute daily to work, the person who has a fairly good standard of living and a fairly good income. You go to some of the suburbs, you get these posh residential homes that sell for 50 or 70 or 100 thousand dollars, and you get the type of person living there that belongs in that area. So that's how it is. Now, you and I have got a city within us. 
many different areas within this city. Now, the citizens of Chicago have quite regularly elected Robert J. Daly as the mayor. And I'm no critic of Mr. Daly. I think on the whole, in a pretty difficult situation, he hasn't been doing too bad a job. But I'm not going to get into an argument about that. However, we all are perfectly well aware that though you may elect your mayor and put him in the mayor's office and he may rule in City Hall, there may be a lot of different areas in that city where he doesn't have the say-so. And Mr. Daly, I think, would be the first to admit that about Chicago. And there's a lot of areas in Chicago where there are other sinister forces at work. The Mafia. There are areas in Chicago where the police don't even go two together armed. Though the right mayor may be in the city hall, there still may be areas in the city where his rule is not effective. Now that's what happens. You can elect Jesus Christ your mayor, you can get the Holy Spirit into city hall, but there still may be areas within you where the mafia is in operation. Don't tell me it isn't so. You know how I know? Because I had the experience myself. You can... Somebody said the man with an experience is not at the mercy of a man with an argument. I don't have to boast. It's humbling. But many, many years after I had been saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit and called to preach the full gospel, I needed deliverance in areas of my life. And I thank, the day, thank God for the day when I saw it and received it. I'll tell you just one example. I was a preacher. I'd been a missionary. I was working in London, England. And I had one problem above others that I simply could not overcome. And when I tell you about it, at least one in every ten persons in this congregation tonight will know from experience the problem. It was depression. A series of tremendous dark depression would come over me, settle down over me and seem to shut me in. And I would feel somehow pressed in. I would feel isolated. I would feel it difficult to communicate, even with the people round about me, with my wife and the family. And I would have this awful embarrassing feeling that wherever I went, I was bringing an evil pressure to bear upon the people with whom I associated. And I tried everything I knew. I prayed, I fasted, I did everything I could, and it got worse. And one of the most humbling things was that when I fasted, the conflict became the most acute. And my own family said to me, Daddy, do stop fasting, you're worse when you fast. And they were quite right, I was. Because fasting did one thing, it brought the problem right out into the open, but it didn't solve it. And so I struggled, I don't remember how long, but years. And one day, reading the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 3, I read these words, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And when I read those words, I suddenly saw by a flash of the Holy Spirit's revelation, my problem, the spirit of heaviness, the spirit of depression, to use modern English. And I realized that I was not fighting myself. I was not fighting some mental or psychological condition. I was dealing with a person who was fighting me as a person, who studied me, who knew me, who plotted my downfall, and was extremely clever and cunning in achieving it. One thing I had observed, that if I let down on my consecration to the Lord, if I didn't really seek to serve the Lord with my whole heart and mind, the pressure lifted considerably. But the more I consecrated myself to the service of the Lord and the preaching of the gospel, the worse the pressure became. You see, I was dealing with an intelligence, one that understood me, read my mind, knew my motives, and it had one main objective, to render me ineffective for God. That was what it was seeking to do. Now, many, many times you will find if you analyze this, your situation and your problem, it should become clear to you that you're dealing with an intelligence that is fighting you intelligently. That's why you have to realize the re reality of evil spirits. Paul said, I don't fight like a man that is beating the air. But I would tell you the majority of modern Christians are beating the air. They're like a blindfolded boxer launching out with his fists, but never knowing if he hits his adversary. They're finding something, they don't know what it is, and they don't know if they hit it. Because they do not realize the identity of the adversary. We have to realize we're dealing with persons, invisible but absolutely real persons that are called demons or evil spirits. 
They study us. They know us. They plot our downfall. They work over a period of 20 or 30 years to bring you to total ruin and destruction. And I'll tell you this, they're just like the mafia, they work in gangs. Very rarely do they work on their own. Let me give you a few examples. A married couple that had been in the Pentecostal movement maybe 30 years, more, came to us some time back, we knew them both, but the wife came by herself. And she said, you know, I want to ask your advice about something. It's a strange thing, she said, but... If I ever really consecrate my life to the Lord, and in the secret of my own prayer, I tell him, Lord, I want to be altogether yours and serve you faithfully. She said, you know, my husband immediately becomes so mean towards me, I can hardly stand it. And yet she said, I never tell my husband what I've said. But it's only when I make this consecration that he gets so mean. Well, I said, the answer is simple. Your husband, with his mind, doesn't know what you've done, but the demon in your husband does. And he's fighting your consecration. He, he's just trying to make you an ineffective Christian. That's all he wants to do. Take another very simple, obvious example. We lived next to some people once in Britain who had a little girl of about three years old. They were keen Pentecostal Christians. And the little girl was a pest. You know the little girls can be pests? All right. When they wanted to go to the market or the grocery store, whatever it was in those days in England, to buy their groceries Friday evening, the little girl would get dressed and toddle off happily with them. But when they wanted to go to the full gospel Sunday school on Sunday morning, she lay on the floor and screamed and kicked her legs in the air. There was something in that little girl that didn't mind the grocery store but hated the Sunday school. And I'll tell you, somebody said once about dogs, it isn't the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. And it isn't the size of the child, it's the size of the spirit in the child. You know, one child can wreck a family. One child can produce chaos and division and strife and darkness in an entire family. It's not the size of the child, it's the size of the spirit in the child. You're not dealing with flesh and blood. Paul said, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with evil spirits, spirits of lawlessness. That's what we're dealing with. Take another simple example. You want to sit up and watch the astronauts on TV, you can sit up and stay awake till 1 a.m., but you decide, tonight I'm going to switch the TV off and read my Bible and pray. You've fallen asleep by 10 o'clock. All right? Did you know that the Bible says there's a spirit of deep sleep or slumber? You'll find it in Isaiah 29 and Romans 11. That spirit doesn't care how long you watch the astronauts, but it doesn't want you to pray and read your Bible. There are innumerable different examples. Of you are dealing with a person. And... This person, together with other persons, in a gang, will plot your downfall. They'll move in stage by stage and section by section to destroy you. Now listen, Jesus told us one very useful piece of information. He said, the thief cometh not, that's the devil, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now you've been told the truth. If the devil ever comes into your life, it is never to do you good. He only comes to do three things. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he does them in this order. He steals, he takes away everything that is rightly yours from God. Such as your peace of mind, your innocence, your health, your family, your friends, your job. Every good thing. If you allow the devil to come in and take over, he'll take them one by one. He'll strip you. He'll treat you like a lemon. He'll squeeze you till there's nothing left and then he'll throw the rind in the gutter. Secondly, he'll kill you. Kill you physically. Many, many Christians die before their time because the devil has killed them. Killed them with tumors, cancers, heart attacks, things that God said you never need to have. Deuteronomy 7.15, I will put none of these evil diseases upon you, but I will lay them upon all them that hate you. God said the sicknesses are not for his people, therefore there are those that hate his people. But many of God's people are smitten by sickness and die untimely. They're killed. They are murdered by the devil. He comes to kill. And after killing, he destroys. This is not physical. This is spiritual. This is not in time. This is in eternity. Jesus said in another passage, I say unto you, my friends, fear not them which kill the body, and after that have no more they can do. 
I will show you whom you shall fear. Fear him who, after he hath killed, hath power to destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. That's the devil. That's his program. We've been had, we've had fair warning. You are not in ignorance. If you ever allow the devil into any area of your life, that's what he came there to do. To steal, to kill, to destroy. He'll go just as far with his program as he's allowed to do. Let's consider for a little while some of the main areas of the city within. Quickly. Now, I'm not a professional psychologist. I just speak from experience. But the Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. And I'll tell you, I'm not trading what I've learned by experience for any theory that anybody has to offer me in exchange. I've bought the truth, and I've bought it pretty dear sometimes, and I'm not selling it. Somebody said, if it works, don't fix it. And that's my motto. As long as it works, I don't fix it. I've discovered it works, and it doesn't need fixing. It just needs using. And I go on using it. Well, I would say the main area in most people's lives, perhaps in every life, is what I would call the area of emotions, attitudes, and relationships. Now, everything that is negative, dark, destructive, discouraging, is ultimately from the devil. But not everything is necessarily demonic. How do you distinguish between that which is simply the project of the old carnal nature, a corrupt tree which always brings forth corrupt fruit, and that which is the direct intervention of a demon or an evil spirit. Now this is not an easy question to answer in one breath. But I would suggest to you that there are certain distinctive marks which if we find them coming definitely and specially in a kind of combined pattern give us clear indication of the presence and activity of evil spirit. First of all I would say one great mark is restlessness. The restless person is always suspect. If you cannot really relax, if you cannot let your hands down, if you've got to be picking at your nails, or if you've got an incurably restless tongue, you can't stop talking. Friends, are out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking. I worked with a medical doctor when I was a medical orderly in the Second World War. For a short time I was in charge of, an, of a reception station right out in the desert for dysentery cases. We had nobody but dysentery cases. And I used to go around with that medical doctor every morning. And he would check on the patient. He was a Scotsman. And he was a little bit, uh, well, I'd say he lived in his own world. He was a brilliant doctor. And I got to know absolutely by heart the first two things he'd say to every patient every morning. The first one was, good morning, how are you? And he just didn't bother to listen to the answer. The next thing was, show me your tongue. And that's what he looked at. And from that, he made a rough diagnosis of the patient's condition. And I sometimes think when God comes into your life, he's not so much interested in what you tell him about how you are. His comment is, show me your tongue. Then I'll know. That's it. You remember what the servant maid said to Peter? Thy speech betrayeth thee. How many people are betrayed by their speech? They're running over. They just cannot sit quiet and relax. Any person that has a deep, settled inner peace and a capacity for relaxation probably needs no deliverance. But you know, there aren't many people like that in church today. Not many. The majority of churchgoers are restless, ill at ease, frustrated, and insecure. Isn't that so? It is. And many of them don't know the reason. Then again, I would say the demonic is compulsive. If you're being pushed and pressed, if you're under some kind of pressure, stop and find out what's pressing you. Then again, the demonic is tormenting. Satan loves to torment the human race. If you're tormented by things that keep rising up and you push them down and they keep rising up again and again and again, they don't seem to be reasonable. And yet they're there. Of all the tormentors, I think fear is the greatest. John says, fear hath torment. In my experience, about one out of five professing Christians are tormented by some kind of fear. That may sound terrible, but I found it to be about the proportion. And then we sing hymns about peace. I'll tell you, fear and peace don't mix. Another thing about demons is they are defiling. 
uh, make you unclean. There's something that you want to recoil from. Something you don't want to face. Something you don't like to look at, and yet it's there. Another thing about demons is they are enslaving. They bring you into slavery. Let me go back then to the various areas. And what I'm going to do now is hold up a mirror to you. And it's your business if you want to look in the mirror. You don't have to look in the mirror. You can turn your eyes away. You can refuse. It's entirely voluntary. I'm not going to walk up to anybody and say, you have an evil spirit. But if you see something in the mirror, it's up to you what you do about it. The area that I spoke about first, emotions, attitudes, relationships. Now, when the thing is abnormal, unnatural, compulsive, obsessive, tormenting, enslaving, such as fear, hatred, resentment, jealousy, envy, pride, self-pity, loneliness, despair, you know the next one after that? You can chart this. Suicide. They go in groups. I'll tell you one group. Is defeat. Self-pity. Loneliness. Despair. Suicide. See, you can tolerate the devil year after year after year. Not realizing his identity and what he's doing. And in most cases, not every case, in order to deal effectively with him, you've got to identify him and deal with him as a person. You do not pray about evil spirits. You command them to go. This is the only scriptural pattern. You don't pray for that throbbing migraine headache. You command the demon of migraine to go. Another area that we face within man is the area of sex. Now, I want to say this, first of all. Sex is not evil. The majority of Christians have the attitude that sex is something evil. Sex is not evil, it is good. God created man and woman sexual beings. And it says at the end of the first chapter of Genesis, when he saw everything had created, it was all very good. Sex, as God intended it, is very good, not very evil. But sex is a very powerful force in our lives. And the devil is smart enough to know that if he can get in in that area and gain some control there, he's gained a very important measure of control over our personality. Now, I want to say this. It is no sin to be tempted. Don't come under condemnation because you're tempted. Jesus was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. If you fall through temptation and commit some wrong act, all you have to do is repent and go to Jesus and confess it, and he will forgive you, and he will cleanse you. And that's the end. It's closed. But if, through wrong acts repeated, you have become enslaved, so that no matter how many times you repent, no matter how many times you confess, you never get permanent deliverance, then I would venture to tell you what you need is deliverance. You have an enemy inside the city a fifth column he's fighting you you know the origin of the word fifth column very interesting because in second world war it was a familiar phrase but i find people growing up today don't really know where it came from it started in the spanish civil war 1936 when the spaniards were fighting the spaniards inside spain and a certain spanish general was besieging a spanish city and the second general came to him and he said, Tell me, general, what is your plan to take this city? And the general said, I have four columns advancing against the city. One from the north, one from the south, one from the east, and one from the west. Then he paused and he said, But it's my fifth column I'm expecting to take the city for me. And the second general said, And where is your fifth column? And the first general said, Inside the city. And if I... Christian is ever defeated, it's always the fifth column that defeats us. We cannot be defeated from without, but the fifth column is the source of all our problems. Now, if you are fighting and fighting and wrestling and struggling, but there's an area where you never gain control, you know what's there? The fifth column, the mafia. You may have the right mayor in the city hall, 
You may have the right laws in the city, but somewhere in there, in that area, is somebody that doesn't care for the mayor, doesn't care for the laws, hates you, and wants to destroy you. And the only permanent practical solution is get him out. Another major area that we face in human beings is what I call the area of appetites and addiction. Now, once again, the normal appetites of man are good. They're healthy. They're given by God. It's right to drink. It's right to eat. If you lose the capacity to eat and drink, it's the devil that's taking it from you. But these things are strong and they can often become perverse and enslaving. Then we call them addictions. And those are demonic. Now the commonest kind of addiction in the United States is food addiction. What the Bible calls gluttony. And in many cases it's just as enslaving as alcoholism. In most cases, an addiction is not the, not the root, it's the branch. A woman becomes an alcoholic because she has financial problems, because of insecurity, or because her husband is unfaithful. The root problem is not the alcohol, it's the frustration that she has. The alcohol is the expression of that frustration. Now, if that woman is an Episcopalian, she'll probably turn to the martini, the cocktail, or the gin. But if the same woman is in the Assemblies of God or the Church of God, she'll probably turn to the cookie jar. And it's absolutely no different. <laughs> now friends, uh, you can smile and I smile too, but I tell you, I have dealt with scores of women that have been in that condition. One woman said to me when she'd been delivered, she said, N and she was a Pentecostal pastor's daughter, she said, no one can tell me this isn't real. She said, it's just as real as having a baby and rather like it. And I've had three. Do you know what that woman told me? She said, you know, I got to such a stage that I would eat the food off my children's plate knowing full well they needed it. I prayed some time back this summer with a Presbyterian minister in his 50s or 60s. An upstanding, strong, but very stout gentleman. Very dignified. But when we came to the deliverance service, he was literally torn from within by something. And when he was delivered, he told the man who was working with him, my problem for years has been the craving for candy. He said, it has absolutely enslaved my life. He said, to the degree where I would go downtown, buy two dollars worth of candy, eat it, and lie to my wife about where I'd be. He said, it has been a total barrier to my effective ministry for Jesus Christ. There are many other forms of addiction, and I suppose this area probably boasts them all. Addiction for alcohol, the addiction for nicotine, the addiction for heroin, and all sorts of other things that we don't need to specify in detail. And I, in my opinion, every enslaving, tormenting, defiling addiction is demonic. It bears all the marks of the demonic. In many cases, people never get true deliverance until they're delivered from the evil spirit. Alcoholics Anonymous, thank God, can bring many alcoholics back into a normal way of life. But in most cases, it never gets rid of the alcohol demon. They can suppress it, they know how to walk around the edge of the cliff, but the thing remains there. It's deliverance that gets the demon out. That's not psychology, it's on a higher plane. It's on the spiritual, not the psychological plane. Thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous and what they do. But I've dealt with many people that have been cured by Alcoholics Anonymous that still had the alcohol demon inside. Then there's the whole area of wrong spiritual teaching and contacts. We can divide this up into two main areas. The area of that which is false Christianity. The cultic. The teachings that deny the great basic truths of the New Testament concerning Jesus Christ. The scripture says in 2 Peter chapter 2, in the last days there shall be false teachers in the church who privily, in a sneaky, underhand way, will bring in damnable heresies, heresies that bring damnation, even denying the Lord that bought them. That's the basic nature of damnable heresy. It's a denial of the Lord Jesus and his redemptive act on the cross. And as far as I'm concerned, I want to tell you this, I believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. I believe in his virgin birth. I believe in his sinless life. I believe in his substitutionary atoning death. I believe in his physical resurrection. And I believe in his personal coming again. And as far as I'm concerned, any church or any group that denies any of these 
is going to get no support from me. And you, dear sisters, I'd ask you to check on what you're doing with the money that you give to the so-called Lord's work. Are you supporting Christ or Antichrist with it? You better check. For my part, I trust I'll never have to answer to God for supporting any form of religion that dishonors his blessed Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, God has given all judgment to the Son, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. You have to honor Jesus Christ in precisely the same measure as you honor God the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father that hath sent him. All these cults, all these seducing spirits and doctrines of demons turn ultimately around the person, the nature, and the work of Jesus Christ. They'll deny the reality of sin. They'll deny his deity. They'll deny his virgin birth. They'll deny the effect of his substitutionary atonement. They'll deny his personal resurrection. They'll deny his coming again. Anything that touches Jesus Christ and belittles him and takes away from him and undoes what he did on the cross and by his resurrection is demonic. And I will have no part with it. None whatever. Let me honor my blessed Lord He's the one that died in my place. He's the one that shed his blood for me. He's the one to whom I owe the salvation of my soul. God forbid that I should ever dishonor or be party with those that do. God forbid that. Now, this area abounds with these cults and they multiply like mushrooms every night. I'm not going to go down the list and name them. You check. What is your attitude to Jesus? Does it hurt you to say Jesus is God? If it does, you check on where you stand. The other kind of religious area is the area that is just non-Christian. Now, I will tell you, and I can say this on the basis of experience, there are many different routes into the spiritual realm. And I've tried quite a number of them. In the period when I gave up Christianity and had not found the Lord, I tried a good many things. I tried Buddhism, Voodoo, Theosophy, Yoga, many types of oriental religion and cults. I became a practicing yogi for a short period. Now, I do not deny that you can get into the spiritual realm by these roots. I know you can do it. I've done it. But I'll tell you one thing. You get into the wrong spiritual realm. You get into the realm of darkness and not of light. I've been there. It's a frightening experience as far as I'm concerned. I did it once and I decided that was enough. But when I wanted to find Jesus Christ, when I sought him as my personal saviour, I was a sinner by any standard. But the barrier, the thing that kept me back from Jesus Christ was not my fleshly sin. Above all else, it was the contact with yoga. My mind was imprisoned. I could not believe the gospel. I could not understand the gospel. I'd been trained to analyse and understand every type of presentation systematically for seven years at Britain's largest university, when I came in front of the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, my mind was totally shackled by yoga, by theosophy, and by all these oriental type of cults. Friends, when I see San Francisco, I know the background of those things. They're not new. They've flourished in the East for thousands of years. All the same features, the long hair, the dirt, the pacifism, the whole thing, not new. Anybody that's familiar with Asiatic cults has seen all this. What's new is it's invading the United States. The United States is being systematically invaded by hordes of demons because it's the one great barrier to Satan achieving his will for the world at the moment. Now I can say this, I'm British. I'm not American. Most of you Americans do not appreciate your own country. And it's a disgrace to you. You should be thankful to God every day that you were born in the United States. When you've seen the way people live in the rest of the world, you go to India and have your yoga and live in the filth and the squalor and the dirt and the shame that it's brought and enjoy it, but you wouldn't. You'd be back on the next boat or the next plane. And in my opinion, it's right shameful to introduce these things into this country. All right, you say, tell it the way it is, and I'm telling you the way it is. I'm telling you the truth. And those of you that are honest will acknowledge it's the truth. Don't tell me it isn't true. I've been there, friends. You go into these places, my footsteps are there in front of you. I know what I'm talking about. I don't say that in condemnation. 
It's loving to tell you the truth, friends. It's just about some time somebody came out and told you the truth the way it is. Somebody loved your soul enough to stop flattering you and playing sissy religious games with you and tell you the truth. No. We come to the close, and this is it. How to get free. Thank God, the Bible says in Joel 2.32, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Whosoever includes anyone in this auditorium here tonight, if you will meet God's conditions and call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be delivered. Thank God the Lord Jesus Christ, by his atoning death and triumphant resurrection, has already defeated all the powers of hell. And he says unto the believer in Jesus Christ, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Friend, if you will submit yourself to God through Jesus Christ in repentance and humility and faith and obedience, you do not need to fear the devil. But if you don't, you better fear the devil. Because he's more than a match for you unless you come to him through Jesus Christ. But if you come to him through Jesus Christ, if you resist him, he will flee from you. If you command him to go, he has to go. These signs shall follow them that believe. Are you a believer? Then they'll follow you. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall expel demons. If you have demons in you, you can expel them in the name of Jesus. You're a believer. You have the right. Jesus says to every believer, I give unto you power over all the power of the enemy. The word of God says to every believer, resist the devil and he will flee from you. People say to me, Brother Prince, you scare me. And I often say, well, probably you needed to be scared in the first place. But once you've got scared and awakened, then stop being scared and do something about it. You don't need to run away. I'll tell you something. Jesus not merely defeated the devil, he stripped him. He left him without any armor. And he gave you the armor if you'll use it. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. When Jesus met the devil... He only used one weapon, the written word of God. It is written, it is written, it is written, and it was sufficient. If you will obey what the written word of God says tonight, if you will take the sword, if you will wield it on your own behalf, submitting yourself to God through Jesus Christ, you can have your problem solved here tonight. That's why I didn't want to go on too long with the song service, because I want to be able to lead those that need help to the place of help here tonight. We're going to have an after service for those that desire it, and we'll have it behind these curtains on the stage. But before I close, I want to give you briefly, in outline, the steps that lead to deliverance. If you cannot remember them, you can pay 25 cents and get my little book, Expelling Demons. It has these six steps outlined there. Number one, the first condition, is humility. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Don't ask God to humble you. He cannot do it. There's only one person who can humble you, and that's you. God can humiliate you, but you don't want him to do that, do you? If you don't want God to humiliate you, you humble yourself, and he'll give you grace. Number two, you've got to be honest. Jesus said you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What do I mean by being honest? Call a spade a spade, and not an agricultural implement. Call your problem by the right name. Don't call it by some fancy psychological, psychiatric terminology which leaves you feeling rather privileged to have such an interesting problem. I tell people, call it by the same name that you'd call it in your husband and you'd call it by the right name. <laughs> and you can apply that the other way around too, with your wife. Number three, confess your sins. It's old-fashioned, but God still requires it. Unconfessed sin is not pardon. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall find mercy. And listen, friends, I've got good news for you. When you've told God the worst about yourself, you haven't shocked him. Because he knew it before. Isn't that wonderful? God doesn't want you to tell the truth for his sake, it's for your sake, that's why. That you may get this awful burden off and know the joy of sins forgiven. The fourth condition is renunciation. A refusal to have anything more to do with the devil. Renounce the sins you confess and renounce every contact with demonic power. If you've been to a fortune teller, renounce it. If you've played with the Ouija board, renounce it. If you've fooled around with marijuana, renounce it. And there's many other renunciations. This is necessary. 
Let me take the example of the fortune teller. You go to the fortune teller. What you're doing in, it, in biblical language is going to a woman with a spirit of divination. And under the law of Moses, such people were put to death instantly. That's what God thinks about it. And you would have been put to death under the law of Moses for going to her. But you're going to Satan's servant for help. And in doing so, you put yourself under a legal obligation to Satan. And you forget about it, but Satan doesn't. He's got a very long memory. And when you come up and want to worship God and enjoy the liberty of the Holy Spirit, something dark comes down over you. Seems to be a barrier between you and God. You say, Brother Prince, others can worship God, but I never get that liberty. A dark shadow comes over me. My first question always is, have you been to a fortune teller? Fifty percent of the time, the answer is yes. Well, I said, you've never renounced it. You've been to Satan's servant for help. You've put yourself under a legal obligation. Before you can have true liberty, you've got to cancel the obligation. You've got to confess it as a sin and renounce it. Say, Lord, I realize I went to the devil's servant for help when I should have gone to you. Forgive me, I'll never do it again. And you'll be surprised the change it will make. If you're in a cult, renounce it. And if you've got the books, burn them. In the 19th chapter of Acts, when the Christians in the city of Ephesus were brought face to face with the reality of demonic power, they were so shaken that they brought out their books and burned them and they were 50,000 pieces of silver worth. $50,000 worth of books burned. And I'll tell you, if we burned all the evil books in this area, it would be something like a million dollars worth. And don't you keep them in your home if you want God's blessing in that home. Take them out. Don't put them in the trash can. Burn them. Then nobody else will be contaminated by them. If you're not willing to do that, I do not promise you deliverance. You can't hold on to the devil with one hand and get God to yank you out of the pit with the other. The fifth condition, and it needs a sermon by itself, forgiveness of other people. This is a basic requirement of God. You are only forgiven by God in the measure in which you forgive others. Therefore, if there is anyone whom you have not fully forgiven, you are not fully forgiven by God. Jesus said this very clearly. If ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father also will forgive you your trespasses. If ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you your trespasses. If there is any person against you have, against whom you have resentment or unforgiveness, and you have not forgiven them, you do not have the legal right to redemption. You are still giving Satan a legal claim in one area of your life, and nothing you can do will break that claim. He's a legal expert. You cannot bluff him. You can shout in his face. You can jump up and down. You can send for 15 creatures. But as long as he has a legal claim, he'll hold on to it. The only way you can break that legal claim is by total, unreserved forgiveness of every person who has ever harmed you or wronged you. And you'll tell me, Brother Prince, I don't feel I can forgive. I say to the woman who's had a miserable life, a husband abused her, beat her, cheated her, and walked out on her after 15 years. And now she can't get over his treatment. She's full of bitterness and resentment. I say, isn't it bad enough that he spoiled 15 years of your life without letting him spoil the rest of them? Isn't it about time? Don't forget, it isn't the person who's resented that suffers most. It's the person who resents. Forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a decision. And when the Holy Spirit prompts you, you can make it. And do it, friend. You don't have to work up an emotion. You have to make a decision with your will and say it with your mouth. If I owe Brother George Gillies $1,000 and he's got my IOU for that amount in his hand, you know what I'm interested in? Not his deep inner emotion, but what he does with the IOU. The moment he tears it up, the matter is finished. That's what you have to do. Tear up the IOU. Drop it in the trash can and walk away from it. Don't go back to it. Don't come back afterwards and stick the pieces together again. I preached like this once and a woman came up to me afterwards. She said, I got rid of about $30,000 in the last 20 minutes. You'd better. When you've met those five conditions, the sixth is call on the name of the Lord. I'll repeat them and close my message. First condition, humility. The second condition, honesty. The third condition, confession of sin. The fourth condition, renunciate, renunciation of sins and of every contact with Satan. I like what Daniel said to King Nebuchadnezzar. He said, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. Break off thy sins by righteousness. That's repentance. It's not a gradual tapering off. It's 
breaking off and it's substituting righteousness for sin. Nebuchadnezzar didn't listen to Daniel and you know what happened? For seven years he was the prey of demons living like a beast naked in the field. He just didn't accept good advice in time. My advice to you, friend, before the devil finally comes in is break off your sins by, re by repentance. Break them. Make a clean break. Sever the connection. You can do it tonight. Fifthly, sixthly, fifthly, forgive all others. Sixthly, call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Do you believe that? then you can be delivered. Let's pray. Now, I want everybody to be quiet and reverent, and I do not want people looking around at other people. Uh, you've looked in the mirror, you've seen your own face and not somebody else's. Now, those of you here tonight that say, Brother Prince, in view of what you've said tonight, I see that there's an area in my life where I need this deliverance, and I mean to get it tonight. I want it with God's help. Would you raise your hand, wherever you may be? Raise your hand. Put it right up. Wherever you may be in this auditorium, put that hand right up, just for a moment. All right, thank you. You may place your hands down again. If there's anybody that didn't get included and you want to be included, raise your hand now. I've seen the other hands. Is there anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. I see that hand. Now listen, there are about at least 40 people, I would say, that raised their hands. And what I want you to do is to get up right now and move out to the front to your left, my right, through that door, and I will go ahead of you and meet you behind these curtains up there, and I will counsel with you and pray with you. Before the others move, stand up and walk up. Now, if you feel embarrassed, that's just too bad. You've got to decide which is more important, what people think or what God says. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sense of your presence here tonight. We thank you for the moving of your spirit. And now I commend those that remain standing before you to your loving care and keeping. Bless them, watch over them, protect them, guide them, have thy way in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.